Oh, boy. Frickna, Sir Frickna, excuse me, Sir Frickna, South Florida. Oh, my name is Ron, and I'm a grateful recovering addict. And man, ain't it good to be clean? Ain't it good to be clean? Ain't it good to be clean? You know, let's thank all these people that gave of their time and their effort to put this on this celebration. They did a wonderful, wonderful job. They did a wonderful, wonderful job. And you know, if you look in the beginning of the NA Basic text, there's a picture of our NA symbol. And that symbol shows the round circle with the points inside going up to freedom, self, service, society, God. They point to freedom. But the biggest part of our symbol is the base, something I hardly ever hear about in NA meetings, and it's called goodwill. And as an expression of goodwill, would everyone in their first year of recovery stand up and let us welcome you to Narcotics Anonymous? Welcome to Narcotics Anonymous. And as a fellowship, we want you to know that we love you. And we want you to keep coming back. And our hope is for you is that you'll keep coming back and stop using in between your meetings. And as time goes on, you'll find that one special person in your life that you can trust. And we call that person a sponsor. And you will trust that person and allow that person to take you through our 12 steps so that you can have a spiritual awakening as a result of them, come in relationship with a power greater than yourself and find freedom from active addiction. That is our hope for you. Uh, I hope this microphone don't need Viagra. All right, it's up. Okay. Woo. You know, <clears throat> I am so nervous right now. My hands are freezing. My, my, my heart is just pounding out of my chest. My armpits are sweating. And I'm thinking, remember all the money we spent to try to feel that way, right? <laughs> All you gotta do is when Sir Frickna calls you to speak on Saturday night, say, oh yeah, I'll do it, you know? So hopefully I can settle down and I can share with you how I got to Narcotics Anonymous and a little bit about what my recovery has been like. You know, uh, I'm a very, very, very lucky guy. Um, uh, most of my friends are dead that I grew up with in New Jersey. Um, most of them never got to sit in a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous, never got to hear our readings, to listen to our message, to find a sponsor, to work steps, to be able to do service work and give of ourselves. You know, most of them never got here. And so I consider myself very, very fortunate to have made it to the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous and even more fortunate to become willing to live this way of life because I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of addicts come to these doors, come to these rooms in a desperate state of mind, get the spirit of willingness for a season, and then leave. So the most important thing in this addict's life on a daily basis is recovery from the horrors of addiction. And so this is a privilege to be able to come and to share a little bit of myself with you all. Florida has been a very special place for me in my recovery. I have a lot of people that I know here, a lot of friends. Um, I used to sponsor a guy who passed away years ago, Jack Wisen, and he opened the door to a lot of people. And uh, I've had a relationship ongoing with Florida when it comes to Narcotics Anonymous. So uh, it's really a privilege to be able to, to be here with you all tonight. And hopefully, I always ask my higher power, please help me. Help me to carry a message of recovery and hope 
so that maybe I can just be able to be used to touch one person. That's my hope. And that's why I like to recognize everyone in their first year. We want you to keep coming back. You are the lifeblood of Narcotics Anonymous. You may not feel like that right now, but you are the lifeblood of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, you know, I grew up in New Jersey. I live in San Diego, uh, California, but I grew up in New Jersey. And um, like I said, you know, most of my friends that I use with aren't here anymore. And uh, I grew up in the 60s. And, uh, you know, everybody thought they were going to face Vietnam, so what the hell, let's just get as high as we can get, and we'll deal with that when it happens. And so in the 60s, you know, we all went from, like, you know, pompadours and high-roll collar shirts and Stacey Adams shoes and suspenders to, like, long hair down to our butts, you know, with upside-down American flags on our Eisenhower coats and bell-bottoms and... You know, every weekend we're at the Fillmore East in New York City seeing a different concert. I mean, it was an incredible time to be alive. And most of us thought that we were free. You know, we had found this brand new freedom that drugs were allowing. We were doing what we wanted to do. You know, we'd go camping, we'd go down the shore, we'd do all these things and everything. It was always centered around drugs. And we all thought we had this freedom. We'd grow our hair. And none of us ever dreamed the bondage that was going to result from that. And um, I used every drug there was, you know. And then what happened to me is at 20 years old, I'm standing in a methadone line in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and I don't know what happened in my life. I can't understand why I'm standing in this line. What happened to my life? I don't understand what happened. And it went on about survival. You know, I hear a lot of people say in these rooms that, you know, they never thought about stopping and they were using and they thought they were going to die that way. I always thought about stopping. I always thought that there's something wrong with this picture. I can't go on living like this. Something needs to change. I remember standing in the methadone line looking at everybody else going, I don't belong here. And I kept using and finding ways and means to get more. And the addiction got deeper. As we all know, our, our literature says that addiction is progressive. It gets worse over time, never better. So if in you're in your first year here with us, please stay. Please stay. Because addiction gets worse over time. It's progressive. It's incurable. There is no cure for addiction. It states that in our literature. And it's fatal. Addiction kills people on a daily basis. So I treasure this time here with you. I treasure this, this, this path that I've been able to walk with your help in Narcotics Anonymous. In 1977, I got what I thought was the biggest break I had going on. My life was destroyed. I had lost everything. Uh, and the PO that I had in Elizabeth, New Jersey, he was a Puerto Rican fella. My, my name's Gonzalo, I'm Spanish. And we related and we kind of clicked. And I had an uncle and an aunt that moved to San Diego, California. My uncle Manny was a detective in New York City Police Department for a decorated 25-year detective. He was very famous. He's the one that found Robert Goulet's daughter when she was kidnapped. He had a lot of juice. I was kidding with Dan about the word juice. <laughs> Talk to him about that after the, the meeting. But anyhow, he had a lot of juice. And my PO petitioned the judge, and they were willing to transfer me to San Diego in the hopes that I could start my life all over again. And I remember putting everything I owned in life in this little 1975 Datsun B210 hatchback. <laughs> Probably about this long, right? Everything I had accumulated up to that point fit in that car. And my sister Diane took a vacation from her job to help me go to California, you know? And, and I remember I remember being in the bars like on Sundays, you know, we'd go over Lower East Side, cop a bundle, come back, fix a little bit, go to the bar for the football games. And I remember it'd be snowing outside and I'd be watching television and it'd show like girls in their halter tops in Pasadena, California. And I used to think like, you know, it's snowing, it's 30 degrees out and like, God, I'd love to live in, in California, you know what I mean? They probably don't even use heroin in California, man. Like, now I want to go to California, you know? So when I got this chance to go to California, I jumped on it. And my sister got in the car with me, and we drove to California from New Jersey. And I didn't know this 
until I was three years clean. But my mom and my dad stood in that driveway waving goodbye to me and my father turned to my mother and said, that's the last time you're ever gonna see your son alive. That's the impact that addiction had on my family. I held my family hostage. I lived at home till I was 27 years old. Only one time did I ever leave the house to try to live on my own. And after six months, I was so physically ill, my parents begged me to come home. Now we call that codependency, but I believe it was love. They thought that just maybe if they could keep me in their home, maybe this was gonna change. And as we all know, addiction doesn't change. It gets worse over time, it's incurable, and it's fatal. So I went to California thinking everything was gonna be different, and I got there, and my aunt and uncle were very wealthy. They lived on a beautiful mountain in La Mesa, California. You could see Mexico, you could see the ocean. They were very wealthy. Everything was different except me. And I started getting that uncomfortable feeling, you know. I had, I, was off, I had been off methadone for two years. I wasn't shooting heroin anymore. I was just drinking like normal people, you know, smoking weed like normal people, you know, eating a couple of Valiums here and there to take the edge off like normal people. You know, nothing wrong. As long as I'm not shooting dope, I'm clean. You know, that's what I'm thinking, right? And that uncomfortability, as we all know, starts to build. That dis-ease started to take over. And in, in a matter of three months, living in this beautiful area in San Diego, California, I'm in a place called Logan Heights, shooting dope with a guy named Bosco, you know? <laughs> and, and he's got no shirt on, he's got this big, he's got all these gang tattoos all over him. He's got this Mexican guy in a sombrero holding a shotgun pointed at me. And it says Logan Heights, right? And I'm thinking like everything was gonna be different. Everything was gonna be different. How many times have we told ourselves, you know, if I just get the right girlfriend, you know, if I just get the right boyfriend, right? If I just got that good job, you know, when the PO cuts me loose and I don't have a tail anymore, you know, if I just got that good job or if I just moved from here to there or whatever, we continue to try to manage our lives. And I failed over and over and over again. And the cycle started again in San Diego. And it got worse and it got worse fast. And when I was 31 years old, I was on methadone again. And I was going to NA meetings in 1981. In 1981, San Diego NA was really small. Really, we, I think we had 12 meetings a week in the county of San Diego. Today we have over 500 meetings a week in the county of San Diego. God has blessed Narcotics Anonymous. So I started going to these meetings and I thought, how are these people gonna help me, man? They sit around drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, talking about their problem. I got a serious heroin problem here. You know, I need some serious help. But I kept going to meetings and I tell people, new people this all the time because it was told to me. Everyone always told me, Ron, keep coming back. I would nod out in the meetings. I'd go, I remember fixing outside in the car. I, had, I didn't have the courage to go to a meeting clean or trying to be clean. You know, I'd have to fix before I went in the meeting. And sometimes I'd fix too much and I'd be nodding out in the meeting and it'd have to wake me up at the end of the meeting. Nobody ever told me, you can't come back here. Nobody never said to me, you're not welcome here. What they said is keep coming coming back and that's what I heard and I struggled for this two-year period in and out of NA I was like this perpetual newcomer you know how in the beginning of our meetings I think it's a little bit like that here in San Diego what we do is we celebrate clean time chips you know and we ask you know if there's anyone in their first 30 days of clean time and I was such a perpetual relapser they would well is there anyone in their first 30 days of clean time we'll start with Ron and we'll work our way around the room Ron yeah. My name's Ron. I'm an addict. Yeah, it's funny to be able to laugh today, but it wasn't very funny in 1981, man. I'll tell you that. So I had this desire to stay clean, and I kept relapsing in and out of. They had back then. They had 30-day treatment centers. I went through three of them in two years. Recovery houses. I was trying really hard. I went to. I was constantly going to meetings, and I couldn't stay clean. And then the miracle finally happened for me. The miracle. You know, it says all other methods 
having failed for us, in desperation we sought help from each other in Narcotics Anonymous. And that's my story. That's my story. In the summer of 1982, a friend of mine who was out of prison, my friend Bobby, him and his brother Paul, and Paul's wife Debbie, there's four of us at this house my parents had helped me buy. They had no idea I was strung out. And they helped me buy a house in a place called City Heights, a really rough area in San Diego. And it was a shooting gallery, turned into a shooting gallery. And there was four of us shooting dope this night. Everybody left, and I started to feel sick, like I just wasn't feeling right, you know? And I went to bed, and I thought, maybe I'm getting the flu, right? And I start burning up with fever, and I'm hot, and my arm's hurting, and my chest is hurting. So I figured, oh, I must be getting sick, flu. So I went up, I went, got out of bed, I went into the kitchen. I had some gin in a bottle, I drank a bunch of gin. I figured, you know, like NyQuil, it'll knock you out or whatever, you know? So I drank a bunch of gin, I went back to bed, and like an hour later, I knew I was dying. I was on fire, I couldn't breathe, I had pain going down my arm. I called 911 and the paramedics came and picked me up. And the fight that went on in the ambulance going to the hospital, I had this massive infection that I shot into my heart. I had a disease called bacterial endocarditis. I didn't, and, I, and this infection, staph infection, is a nasty thing if you get it on your hand. But it's really nasty if it lands in your heart. And it started spreading through my body. And I had septicemia, which is a blood infection. I had 105 fever. My two top ribs were being eaten away from this staph. I had something called osteomyelitis. My kidneys shut down. I had hepatitis C. In 1982, they didn't know what hepatitis C was. They called it non-A, non-B. And I was stuck on these machines in this hospital, uh, literally dying, really, really just dying, tired. And uh, didn't want to die, but I was very, very tired. I hear people saying they wanted to die. I didn't want to die. And hell no, I didn't want to die. I wanted to live. But it looked pretty doubtful. It looked pretty bad. And so I was put on these machines, and I was in this hospital in uh, San Diego, and after about two weeks, they were hitting me with them roll every three hours. And then I wasn't doing nothing because I had a habit. So that was just keeping me well. So they put me on Visterol, which slowed down my breathing, which started to ease the pain. And they're hitting me with them roll. And after two weeks, the doctor comes in, Dr. Wolf. And he says to me, he says, Ronnie, he says, you've got five doctors. You know, this is wrong. That's wrong. This is, we're going to treat you. You're going to be on these machines for two months. And hopefully we're going to turn this thing around. We're going to call your family in New Jersey and tell them that you're very, very sick and we're hoping that you're going to make it out of here. You understand? I go, yeah, I understand. They go, and if you ever stick a needle in your arm again, you're going to blow out your heart, Bob. Do you understand that? Yes, I understand. And as soon as the doctor walked out the room, and you know exactly what I'm going to say, because we probably all lived it one way or another, the thoughts, man, you're in a hospital, you're dying, man. This is scary. Man, it, 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 you're all by yourself. You need a fix. This ain't, you know, this isn't, this is bad. They said you might die. And I had $1,700 in cash from a, from a fake homeowner's claim that I had put in for a robbery. Me and my friend stole everything out of the house, broke the back windows. I'll never forget the cop taking the report, looking at me like, I don't believe that. And he had to take the report. And you know, I'm all pinned and I'm not and it's not. And he's like, what else happened? Oh, really? Oh, what else did they get? Oh, really? So I get this check for $1,700. I had just cashed it. That's why we were all spurred and shooting dope at the house. I still had the money on me. Now I'm in a hospital and I'm, I'm scared. I'm petrified. I need a fix. So I call Bobby on the phone. Bobby, it's Ronnie. Hey, where you at, man? I'm in a hospital. What do you mean? I said, well, I got this sickness, but don't worry about that. You want to get well? Yeah. I said, well, bring me a couple of balloons and stuff and an outfit. Oh, all right, where are you? I'm in room 816, Sharp Cabrillo. Oh, all right. So now the madness is on and the thinking is going. And I'm thinking, how am I going to pull this off? Right? I, I need a fix. Now Bobby's coming up. Now N.A. hears, oh, Ronnie G's dying in the hospital. You better go see him, you know. Oh. This might be the last time you ever see him. You better go visit him. So now I'm laying. I got all these machines. I'm hooked up to breathing machine, heart apparatus. I got an intravenous in me, right? Big oxygen, no smoking sign, right? And here's all these beautiful people like yourselves. Come into the room like, oh, Ronnie, you better pray for the willingness to do whatever it takes to get clean this time. You, you might want to consider going to a long-term, yeah, could you, uh, that, thank you very, can you, can you go now? Thank you. Uh, 
I'm expecting someone, you know. So then now Bobby's bringing me heroin to the room every day. He's down in the lobby. Uh, Ron, he calls me on the phone. He was called Mumble. He talks like Mumble, you know. Hey, Ron, anybody up there? Any people up there? Yeah, hold on. You better not come. Hold on. And it's crazy. It's madness. It's insanity. I'm getting them all every three hours. I get, I mean, Visterol. I'm shooting two bags of heroin a day. Bobby's coming back and forth. We're doing transact. NA people are coming up. And then who walks in the door? My mother and my sister from New Jersey. I, I can't believe this. They had called him and said, you know what? Your son might die. You better get out of here. He's really, really sick. You know, we don't know if we're going to be able to do this. So they come cross. This is the kind of family I have. Diane quits her job, my mother and my sister put the dog in the car, and they drive 3,000 miles from New Jersey to my hospital room. You think I'm happy to see them? <laughs> First thing I'm thinking is, oh, shit. How am I going to pull this off, you know? I mean, my, I haven't showered in almost a month. My hair, I look like Don King. My hair standing up like this. I got this little gray smock with my ass hanging out the back, right? Intravenous things, hard money. My sponsor, Phil, comes to the, oh man. My sponsor, Phil, you know, comes to the hospital. Hey, I better go see my sponsor. He might die, right? He walks in. I'm nodding out with a cool filter king in my hand, right? Almost burning the bed, and there's a big sign oxygen, no smoking. He wakes me up. He goes, What are you doing? I go, Oh, hey, Phil, man, it's good to see you. He goes, what are you doing smoking? You, it's just oxygen, no smoking. I go, oh no, that sign's for you, not for me. Oh, I can't get out of here. I got to smoke. What do you mean? No, that's for you. You can't smoke in the room. Self-centered insanity. Now mom and Diane are there, and I'm thinking, how am I going to pull this off? Bobby's going to be calling every morning, 10 o'clock. What do you need today? Putting in my order. And now the madness starts. Remember those days, people? Remember when our mind, we could not get off that fixed idea of just one more. And it was insanity. You know, I, I think about insanity. I, this is what I picture in my mind. I love this analyzation of insanity. To me, insanity is like an addict and a normal guy. They want to go, they're, they're working, they want to go to lunch, right? And so there's a luncheonette about a quarter mile away, and there's this brick wall, and the addict doesn't want to walk all the way. He goes, let's go through the brick wall. <laughs> Normal guy goes, it's a brick wall. What are you talking? No, 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 on reality TV, I saw this. If we run really hard this way and hit it on an angle, we can get through that brick wall. Are you with me? Normal guy, okay, you know, and he grabs his hand and they run. They bam into the wall, they fall down, of course, they're bleeding, broken nose. Normal guy gets up and goes, you're out of your freaking mind, man, that's a brick wall. You're crazy. I'll never do this again with you, I'm out of here. And he walks away, right? The attic stands up, bleeding, looks at the wall and goes, you know, maybe if we hit it this way. Maybe instead of, you know, if we just kind of, and isn't that what we do? Over and over and over the insanity of the justification and the rationalization of the next one. And that's what it was for me in this hospital. And one day Bobby calls me up and mom's over here and Diane's over there and hey Hans, Bobby, I got, I'm in the lobby, can I come up? No, you can't come up, my mother's here. Oh, you got five minutes to come down. Come down, yeah, or I'm leaving, click. My mind. Remember those days, my mind. I'm thinking, okay, so how do you do this? Take out the intravenous. My mother goes, what are you doing? I said, I gotta get my meds, Ma. They forgot my meds, Ma. Take it off the breathing machine. Take it off the heart monitor. I, my, I tell you, I have this little gray smock with my ass hanging. And, I'm, and when, I don't know if you ever had endocarditis, but it's like cotton fever to the 20th degree, okay? All your joints lock up. You can hardly walk. And I've gotta get down to the lobby. Right? I mean, if I don't, I'm missing my issue. So I'm walking past the bed. My mother, like, where are you? I'm being, you know how we get when someone starts to confront us? We get loud. We think if we get loud enough, they'll back. Why not, Mom? Get my meds. You know? Oh, okay, son. All right, son. I'll, we'll be right here waiting for you. Past the nurse's room, onto the. I'm on the eighth floor, folks. Down the elevator. Elevator opens up. This little old lady with flowers sees me in this condition. Like, you know, I miss. How are you? Nice to see you. You know, I go out. 
Bobby's not now. Bobby, give it up. Gives me the outfit. I have no pocket, so I put the spoon and outfit under my arm, throw the balloons of heroin in my mouth, get back, and all I can think is, we've got to get this in you. you got to get this in you. you got to get this in you. Get up to the eighth floor. The, the doors open up. There's two nurses, my mother and my sister. Where did you go? I go, oh, don't, nothing, Ma. That's all right. It's a, and they're all yelling at me. We're calling the doctor. We're calling the police. And all I can think is, get to the room. Get to the room. So I get to the room. They're like, hey, hey, hey. They're all cackling hens, yelling at me, right? All right, all right, all right. I'll be right. i got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right out. And I get in the bathroom. Shut the door. Open the door. What are you doing in there? I said, I'll be right out, right? And so I take out the balloons. I take out the spoon. I throw them in the spoon. I got the outfit. There's no sink. Ah, <laughs> oh, what the hell, you know? So I'm drawing the water out of the toilet. I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to cook it. You know what I mean? It's going to be sterilized, right? Here, I got this massive heart infection that's gone through my whole body. The insanity. And you know what I'm talking about. You all know what I'm talking about. Ain't it good to be clean? Come on! Oh. Finally, the gig was up. Busted. All right, now I want to get clean. <laughs> All right, I'll do anything. And luckily, I had a change of heart. You know, that gift of desperation. One morning I woke up and I looked around me and I saw myself as I really was for the first time in my entire life. Everything I had tried to do to find happiness in life, peace of mind, friendship, love, romance, security, Everything I tried wound me up in this hospital killing myself. And I couldn't stop. And I broke down like a little baby. I just broke down sobbing. I saw myself as I really was. And I reached out and I asked for help. I said, I need help. I can't stop shooting heroin. Can you please help me? And they brought doctors in and there was detox. I was able to detox in that hospital. And I spent two months on those machines and the first day they let me out of the hospital, my mother and my sister drove me two hours north to a place called Pasadena to a recovery house. And I, and I lived in a live-in recovery house for the first six, seven months of my recovery with 65 other addicts. And I'll never forget walking up to that house. I was very sick. Even though I had dodged a bullet, I was on dicloxacillin for three months until my liver finally gave out from the medications and I had clinical hepatitis and just couldn't take any more medicine. But I remember walking up to that recovery house and here's these addicts out front raking nothing. I'm like, where's the leaves? Just for today. Keep coming back. I'm like, what the hell are they raking? For? There's nothing here, right? So I started, I went to this recovery house and I spent my first seven months in this recovery house, went to three NA meetings a day, got a sponsor, worked up to my eighth step. I, they graduated me out of this recovery house and I asked them, could I stay an extra month? And they looked at me like, what did you just say? I said, I'd like to give back to this recovery house. Could I stay an extra month? They had never had anyone say that to them, right? So I stayed there eight months, went back to San Diego. I was scared to death because I had wreckage in San Diego. I had stole money from groups. I had stole money from individuals. You know, I was a sick, suffering addict. And uh, this guy, Matt Siegel, who passed away years ago, and he died in the 80s with like 35 years clean. He, uh, I said, Matt, what do I do? I'm going back to San Diego. I'm scared to death. I don't know if they'll accept me back there. And he said the most profound thing that I hold my heart every day of my life to this day. He says, Ronnie, don't worry about it. He said, you've got an incurable, progressive, fatal disease known as addiction. And as long as you keep your daily reference and your daily focus on your recovery, the rest of your life will take care of itself, whether you like it or not. That's what he said. And he said, Ronnie, if you take your focus off your recovery on a daily basis, you will start to suffer the pain of addiction. And I have suffered the pain of addiction in recovery without ever picking up a drug. You know, when I was two years clean, I met her. <laughs> right? Or is it him? You know what I'm talking about. Wow. And it's like, we're going to make this work. You know? You know? Once she gets a sponsor and works some steps, we're going to be okay. You know? Or, you know, if, if, 
if we just moved to another city, we would be, and no one knew us, we'd be okay, you know? Or if she just went to therapy, things would be okay, you know? And it was insanity. Back and forth, obsession. What was the first thing I thought about in the morning when my eyes opened up? Her. What was the last thing I thought about after my prayers and got into bed? Her. I was obsessed with another human being, and it almost killed me. And we see it kill a lot of us around here. And I was so fortunate that I never took my eye off recovery. She used to say things like, you go to way too many meetings. Way too. And why do you give your sponsees money? You don't even have that much. You should be keeping your money. And you do too much service work. And luckily, I had enough sanity to know I needed to keep my eye on recovery. And after two years of back and forth, we split up. And I survived that. I remember when I was just about five years clean and all my teeth, I had, I was telling Jimmy, I started shooting speed before I shot heroin. I shot speed for a year and a half, I couldn't hang. I don't know how you people do that, I really don't. I was 125 pounds, same size, could see all my ribs, didn't know who I was half the time. My mother thought I had cancer, right? And so. I had a switch, you know, and I made that switch. But all my teeth, I hadn't gone to the dentist since I was 13. So all my teeth kept rotting away. So I would go to the dentist, have it pulled, get a prescription Percocet with one back up. You know how that one goes, right? So I'd pull in this one, pull in that one, pull. Now we're getting down and there's hardly any teeth. I'm 26 years old. I had an insurance policy, so they capped all my teeth that were left, what they call a horseshoe on, right? Well, I'm still shooting dope. So now everything's rotten underneath. So now I come to recovery and guess what? All my teeth are rotten out. And I ain't got any, I'm $80,000 in debt when I hit recovery. I don't know what your situation is, but I was $82,000 in debt. Just the hospital bill for two months was $365,000 and I owed 20% of that. And then there was all other kind of creditors lined up. Bottom line was I met a man in these rooms, God bless him, Dr. John Fessel, who, who knew my situation when he heard me share. He said, I want you to come to my office. I'm gonna help you out. I'm gonna work on your teeth and all you have to do is pay me money when you can. This will talk about a blessing from God, right? So I go to see Dr. John, he looks at my teeth. He goes, yep, this is like the Super Bowl. He says, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna chisel off all your caps, 14, and then I'm gonna pull out the roots and I'm gonna give you a plate. Sound good? I say, yeah. And I'm not gonna knock you out. And I'm like, uh, say what? <laughs> you're not gonna knock me out? He goes, no, he says, I'm gonna numb you up. I know you're a heroin addict. I don't wanna give you anything that's gonna alter you. I'm gonna numb you up so much, you're not gonna feel a thing, okay? And I made a decision to turn my teeth over to the care of Dr. John Fessel, right? And I, I never forget sitting in that room, right? And you can hear, ka -tink. And it smelled like a sewer, man. Blood's flying. Now, what is that smell, man, right? So I leave. I got all my teeth pulled out. I got a mouthful of gauze. I go home and I think, this is a great time to quit smoking. You know? I, yeah, I got all this blood and, and gauze in my mouth. And I tell the girl I'm with, I'm not going to smoke anymore. I quit. Really? Yeah, I quit. So if I ask for a cigarette, don't give it to me. All right, cool. Two hours go by. Three hours go by. Honey, get me a, go down to 7-Eleven, get me a pack of Cools, would you? Oh no, you said you weren't going to smoke anymore. I said, well, I know, but you know, I've, I've got this thing with the tea, you know, so just, would you please just go to, go down and get me a pack of Cools now, right? So here I am smoking and I'm justified in my mind, I got all this gauze, and I, well, it's like another filter, right? So I'm smoking, and it's, the, and all the gauze is turning orange, you know? Stick a new one in there, you know? But here's the miracle, folks. When I had five years clean, I surrendered the longest addiction of my life, cigarettes. And I haven't had one since that day. <clears throat> and I believe that if I hadn't done that, I would not be here tonight with y'all. I don't believe I'd be alive. That was 24 years ago. I had emphysema starting back then. I had scarring all through my lungs. And I don't think I'd still be alive if I hadn't surrendered that illusion. Cigarettes was my first drug. When I was nine years old, I remember my first cigarette like it was yesterday. We were playing army in New Jersey in the woods. 
And Andy Jingaleski, who died of this disease, came rolling up with three Salem's that he stole from his dad. And he said, come on, let's fire these guys up. And I put that cigarette in my mouth. You know, in the 50s, they had these, like, uh, war stories on television, Sergeant Rock, you know, and a guy shooting the Germans and got a cigar sticking out of his mouth. He was really bad, man, right? So I stick the cigarette in my mouth and I light it up and I got my little Tommy gun, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is fun playing guns, but it's going to be so much cooler when I fire up this cigarette. It changed my perception about myself and the world around me. And that was my first act of addiction that I remember. My second act of addiction was stealing. I was a thief. I was a little kleptomaniac at 10, 11 years old. I would steal just for the fun of stealing, you know? And that went on until I found drugs when I was 13 years old. So anyhow, I quit smoking at five years clean. And I believe that that has helped me, you know, a lot of people don't want to even talk about that. I remember one time, I remember I'd be in the morning, I wanted so bad to get off cigarette. I'd be wheezing. You know, have a girl over and, and she's laying in bed with you and all of a sudden you hear. Did you hear that? No, I didn't hear nothing, you know. It sounded like an ambulance. I don't know. Or, you know, you'd walk up to somebody in a meeting in the old days when you could smoke and, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm sorry, you know. This thing would fly out of your mouth and land on their chest. And I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm going to quit. Yeah. Oh, I didn't tell you. I got the nicest teeth going now, baby. I forgot that part. Yeah. Anyhow, where were we? Anyhow, so <laughs> five years clean, I quit smoking. 1989, I get a phone call from my mother. Your dad has stomach cancer. You gotta come home. All right, Ma. I'll get a leave of absence from work. <clears throat> so uh, I got a leave of absence from work in San Diego. They gave my father three to six months to live. And I went back to New Jersey. And that's when I met CJ. Going to NA meetings, you know, in a lot of pain, in a lot of powerlessness, and a lot of suffering, not being able to help my dad and watching this man just dwindle away in front of me. I'll never forget standing on the front porch with him holding a bucket while he vomited blood. And I used to be so nervous and so upset and the only relief I had was going to NA meetings with my friends in New Jersey that I met in the program. Those people carried me, those people helped me to not use and not smoke a day at a time. And uh, the hardest thing was is that um, two weeks before my father died, my company said, you have to come home. You're going on strike. We can't, we can't extend your leave. You have to get back here. And uh, I had to say goodbye to my father, <clears throat> knowing that, um, that I would never see him alive again. You know? And this was my hero, man. I, uh, this, this guy, uh, he was always there for me, always there for me. You know? uh, took me to the Little League, you know, take me to dances. Um, never gave up on me. You know, I saw him drunk once his entire life, one time, you know. He was a, a hell of a dad, and, uh, and I had to say goodbye to him. And I remember at eight years clean how guilty I felt. I had this, I had worked the steps, but I still had this, I had made amends to my family. I had this, this feeling in bed when I was holding him in my arms, this little bag of bones and saying, Daddy, I'm so sorry if I upset you, man. I, you know, I didn't mean to put you and Mommy through this, man. I really didn't, because I felt in my heart that something, that my addiction had something to do with his cancer, you know? And he, he was such a great dad, you know, he looked at me and he said, he said, Ronnie, you know, you have nothing, <clears throat> you have nothing to be sorry for. I love you so much. He said, I got my son back because of Narcotics Anonymous, you know? Love you, <clears throat> And I'll never forget pulling away from the house with my brother Robert, my sister Diane, and my brother Ramon, and looking up in the window and seeing my father wave goodbye. And that's the last time I saw him, until I came back three weeks later to bury him. <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, we do inventories, we do eighth steps, nine steps, you know, we make amends, and I don't know about you guys and gals, but... Uh, you know, when I was 16 years clean and I had been through the steps a number of times, <clears throat> I had a lot of freedom in my life. 
And they asked me to speak in Canada one time in a place called Castlegar, a real little place above Spokane, Washington. And uh, they said, look, it's so small here, we can't get a plane in here, but what we're going to do is we're going to fly into Spokane. Some NA members are going to pick you up and you're going to come up uh, through the Canadian border to the con conference. Is that all right? I said, oh, that sounds like wonderful, right? And I had spoken in Calgary, Canada in 1991, where I flew in, there was no problems, right? So now we got this caravan of cars going up to Canada. We're all talking. We're all having fun. We get to the border crossing. There's a little, uh, what are they, the uh, Mountie or whatever they call it, a Canadian cop, right, at the, at the thing, you know. And he says, gentlemen, pull over here. He goes, where are you going? And the guy driving, David, goes, oh, we're going to an NA conference. And Ronnie's the guest speaker on Saturday night. He goes, that's great. He goes, son, have you ever been arrested? And I'm looking at Dave, I'm 16 years clean, and I'm going, tell him no, tell him no, just tell him no. <clears throat> and he goes, the guy goes, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've been arrested. He goes, Mr. Gonzalez, have you ever been arrested? I go, well, yeah, I've been arrested. So will you please pull over here, I'd like to speak to you, right? Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but in Canada, they have a law. If you've been convicted of two or more felonies, they don't want you in Canada. <laughs> Stay in the United States. So the guy goes on the computer, he brings all this stuff, they're not letting me into Canada. And now they're gonna redline me. They say, if you ever try this again, next time you go to jail. You understand that? So the Canadians were very nice, we talked. The guy calls the committee, he goes, look, the Canadian guy goes, if you give us $325, we'll let you go in for the weekend. And I'm like, I'm on a fixed income, I ain't got that kind of money, you know? I ain't that willing, you know what I'm saying? The committee drives all the way to the border, pays $325 to get me because, and this is such a great idea that you didn't put any names on the program of who was speaking. Because they had Ronnie G, San Diego, California. So they felt they had to come and get me. So they paid the $325. Do you know what I felt like that weekend walking around with my head down? Oh my God. That's the guy. Yeah, him. $300. <laughs> $325, just right here, this guy, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I felt terrible. But I also found out that we say things around here, and our past is our past, but my past can become my future like that, with one bad decision. That's all I'm away, one bad decision, away from jails, institutions, and debt. You know, I do a lot of service. Um, I love service. When I completed my 11th step the first time, my higher power told me, you want to be rewarded, be of service. You know, we talk about a spiritual life in Narcotics Anonymous. You hear people talk about it all the time, and you hear all these different takes on what spirituality really is. And for me, for this addict, what I found out, what spirituality is, I can go to churches, and I can read books, and I can have that higher power, this higher power, whatever. But the most spiritual thing that I can do as an addict in recovery is either offer you help or ask you for help. Nothing is more spiritual than those two acts to me. And I never dreamed what service was going to become for me. I started doing H&I at a year, a little over a year. Actually, I took my, I went to my first H&I panel when I was in a recovery house at six months clean. I wear this because I've been doing H&I for over 27 years, every month. And I don't say that, I don't say that to say, oh, ooh, look at him. That's the way my higher power has said, this is how you're going to live your life, by saying thank you. See, gratitude is not a feeling, I found out. Gratitude is an act of the will. Most people aren't grateful, they're thankful. They feel thankful. Then you ask them to do something, well, I, I, I'm too busy, or I, I used to do, I love that one, I used to do service. What, you, you graduated or something? I, uh, you know, it's that line in the book once again, and I see it in recovery all the time, the illusion of every addict is that somehow they can manage their own lives. And I've watched a lot of people, 20, 25 years clean, 19, 17, we just lost one 17, use again. Use again. Make that one bad decision. 
So for me, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to do service on an ongoing basis. Like I said, I've been doing H&I every month for over 27 years. I love it. I coordinate facilities. I go into two different county jails, detox. I do the phone lines. I sell literature at the region because it's my way of saying thank you. You see, you're going to get what you give and not a, not a, not a penny more. And so I found out from Pepe years ago, he said, Ronnie, I take it out of this pocket, I give it to you, and the other pocket's full. And that's been my life. That's why I'm here today. I didn't send uh, CDs out or try to manipulate. No, my, my higher power said, I want you there, and he worked out everything to get me here. I was in the lobby today, and I thought I saw a ghost. There's a kid that got clean, 19 years old in San Diego, Frank. And I turn around and he's standing there. I haven't seen him in over 20 years. He lives in Miami now. And God said, this is why I brought you here. This is why we had lunch, we talked. He's got 63 days clean. He's, yeah, he's having a rough time. Yeah. He's having a rough time. So I know why I'm here. I'm here because my higher power wants me to carry the message. And that's it. Uh, I want to share this real quick um, about service. I was saying that I never realized being involved in service what was going to happen. Um, seven years ago, I've been with the same woman in Narcotics Anonymous for 22 years. So if someone tells you that a relationship can't work in Narcotics Anonymous, tell them, oh no, you're wrong, because Ronnie G's been with his girl and wife for 22 years. It is possible. My focus is not my marriage. My focus is my recovery. And my marriage gets better. Just like Max told me. Just like Max told me. <clears throat> she got clean at 18 years old, Michelle, my wife. And she's coming up on 25 years clean. So the other message I want to carry is that young people, don't believe your head. You can get clean young and stay clean. Yes. So after being together for 15 years, I asked her to marry me again, seven years ago. And she said, yeah. And so we were planning our marriage and uh, I go back to New Jersey every year. I go back usually for a month in the spring and a month in the fall. My mother's 90 years old, lives in the house I grew up in in New Jersey with my N.A. friends, and C.J. was one of them, taking her to the doctor, going to the store, getting her what she needs. N.A. is not only saving my life, it's saving my family's life. My mom is alone in that house only because I have friends in recovery that are able to help her until my brother and sister can get there to help her. And so I go home, like I do every spring, and uh, my brother Ramon, who had mental, he was mentally ill, he was duly diagnosed. He was paranoid, schizophrenic. He got sick in his late 20s. He had a great job, he lost a job. He wound up in mental institutions. It was a very, very sad life my brother had. But he was on medication and they were able to stabilize him. We got him a little apartment in Linden, right next to where I grew up in Roselle. And he was like, I bought him a car, he was my mother's chauffeur. He took mom everywhere, you know? So it kind of worked out good. And he picked me up at the airport and I look at him, I go, Ramon, you're yellow. Something's wrong, man, you got hepatitis. And he goes, yeah, I know, Ronnie. I said, no, you, there's something wrong. You're yellow, your eyes are yellow, your skin is yellow, you gotta go to the doctor. Ronnie, I don't like doctors. I said, I know, Ray, but you gotta go to the doctor. Long story short, he went to the doctor and he had pancreatic cancer. And the doctor said uh, he, he probably has about three months to live. And, uh, and now I'm getting ready to get married on July 3rd of that year, seven years ago. And now I find out my brother's dying of cancer. And when he took me back to the airport to go back to San Diego, you know, I hugged him and I kissed him like I always do. And he looked at me and he said, Ronnie, I hate doctors. I said, I know, Raymond. He says, um, <clears throat> will you help me die at home? Everything inside of me said, no, Raymond, I can't do that. You're my brother. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to take some care of someone who's dying. No, I can't do that, Raymond. 
<clears throat> but what came out of my mouth was, Raymond, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just let me know when you want me here and I'll be back. And I flew back to California and it was kind of a weird time because we were getting married, but there was this cloud over my whole family's head with my brother dying of cancer in New Jersey. My sister Diane stayed home to be with him. My mom came out, my brother and his wife and my two nieces and nephew came out and it was a wonderful, glorious time. They stayed with us for two weeks, but it was a sad time because Raymond would call me every day and I'd sit and I'd talk to him. And uh, you know, and there was times that all I could do was listen. You know, as a sponsor, I want you to know something. One of the best things that I can do instead of telling you what you should do is listen to you, to love you, to guide you, to direct you, to support you in your efforts at recovery, not mine. And I would listen to Raymond and I would try to be a comfort. And we got married and everyone went home and then Raymond called that one day and said, Ronnie, the hospice lady wants to talk to you. You need to come out here now. I said, all right, Raymond. So in August, uh, I packed up everything and I, I had a bad shoulder. I got a shot in my shoulder and I, it was miraculous that it helped my shoulder because I had a year and a half of shoulder problems and it helped. Got on the plane, went to New Jersey and my brother lived in a little 200 square foot apartment in Linden, New Jersey. Um, there was a bathroom and then one big room with the kitchen and the sofa and the living room it was a very small apartment, and he lived on the couch. That was his bed. And, um, and I moved in with Ramon, and uh, he had all these medications I had to give him. And one of the things that he had to take was morphine sulfate. And every time I would touch that drug, I would say, God, please keep me free from addiction. I didn't even, I would wash my hands after I gave him the pill. So here, Raymond, here's your pill, you know, and I would wash my hands. I was so afraid that I was going to say, you know, F it and just pop one in my mouth. And my wife, another addict in recovery, said, if you need my help, call me. And I called her, because Raymond was a big man. He was like six foot, 300 pounds, and we had a hospital bed in his living room, and it was hard, like, changing him and turning. So my wife came out, another addict in recovery, and the two of us, my NA friends in New Jersey, gave us an air mattress to put in the kitchen so that we could sleep there. And uh, <clears throat> we stayed with Raymond till the end. And uh, my mom, my brother Robert, my sister Diane, my wife Michelle, me and the hospice nurse were all there when Raymond took his last breath. And um, that, that didn't come from me. I'm a coward. I've been running my whole life. The last thing I want to do is face anything. That came from Narcotics Anonymous. You know, my brother, my mom is a wonderful lady, church-going lady. She believes in God. My sister's the same way. My brother's never been high a day in his life. He's got a beautiful wife with three kids. Wonderful, wonderful people. When Ramon got sick, you know who he asked to help him? Me. His junkie brother. Because he had seen what Narcotics Anonymous had done in my life, and he trusted me. He trusted me to help him leave here. And I will be forever, ever indebted to the program of Narcotics Anonymous for giving me what I need, needed when I needed it to help my family. Um, I'm going to end with a, uh, a little story about these two addicts in San Diego. Uh, like I told you, 1981, NA was very small. And everybody knew everybody. In a meeting, when you went into a meeting of NA in 1981 in San Diego, if you didn't know somebody in the room, they were either new or they were visiting. Everybody knew everybody. It was a very close-knit society. And there was these two guys, Tony and Al. These, they came in as newcomers through a treatment center, and they became best friends. And they went to meetings. Everywhere you went, Tony and Al were at these meetings. And they were just thick as thieves. They even got jobs together in the same factory in San Diego. And wouldn't you know it, they married sisters. I mean, these guys were tight. <laughs> tight, right? So one day, Tony says to Al, he says, Hey, Al, you know, do you think there's a heaven? I mean, do you think there's a Narcotics Anonymous meeting in heaven? And, and uh, Al goes, I don't know, Tony, you know. He says, but uh, why don't we do this? Let's make a blood pact, me and you, that whoever dies first will come back and tell the other one if there is Narcotics Anonymous in heaven. Yeah, okay, so they cut their wrists, you know, and they do the blood thing, right? And all right, cool. Two weeks later, Al's walking across the street downtown San Diego, bam, gets run over by a bus. Horrible. Killed dead. The whole fellowship is mourning. Just so sad. Al is gone. Big N.A. memorial. Everyone is distraught. Tony goes home. He can hardly even sleep at night. He's in his bed night after night after night thinking about his buddy Al. And about three weeks later, one night he hears this. 
looks up. What the? Ooh, is this white light pulsing on the ceiling. He says, Al, it's Tony. He goes, oh my God. He says, I have come back from heaven. He goes, this is incredible. I don't believe it, Tony. Tell me, is, is there an NA meeting in heaven? And he goes, well, Al, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. He goes, okay, well, tell me what the good news is. He says, well, the good news is, is a gigantic NA speaker meeting in heaven and I'm the secretary. He goes, oh, that's fantastic. What's the bad news? You're my speaker on Sunday. <laughs> Sorry if you've heard that before. I just love that little thing. And I want to end with this. You know, Narcotics Anonymous has given me freedom from active addiction. And most of that freedom from active addiction comes from the change in my thinking. And as I stay connected, I'm working on my second step right now in the step working guide. And I, what happens to me is my, my connection with the steps, what happens is it changes over time because my life changes over time. One of the biggest things of a spiritual awakening that I realized when I went through the steps the first time is that circumstances and conditions in my life have nothing to do with my recovery. And if I allow them to have something to do with my recovery, I start to get sick. So that was an awakening that I've carried to this day and I hope, I know the odds are against me, but I hope I can carry it to the day I die and I hope the day I die, I die clean. And I just want to leave the new people with this because this has to do with what Narcotics Anonymous and the 12 steps have done for this addict. You know, if you always think the way you've always thought, you're always gonna feel the way you've always felt. And if you... And if you always feel the way you've always felt, you're always gonna do the things you've always done. And if you always do the things you've always done, you're always gonna get the things you've always gotten. And if you always get the things you've always gotten, then you're always gonna think the way you've always thought. Thank you, South Florida.